Hello everybody, you have tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I cover virtually any aspect of making a murderer. I go over the evidence, the documents, the photos. So if you'd like, stay tuned and in the future I'll have many more videos besides the one you're about to see. Hello everybody, how you doing today? We're here today to talk about Zellner's latest motion filed today on November 16th of 2017. Um, it was filed today and it's got some more stuff in it, some more, you know, pieces of evidence or pieces of, you know, the pie, I guess, as it were. Um, more stuff about Bobby, the computer, Scott, um, also um, possible another possible Brady violation that we're looking at here where some possible evidence was held withheld and not and it was kind of withheld and, and made obscure. Um Basically, there was one piece of paper slipped into a huge, huge batch of discovery. One tiny little piece of paper report where it says that Tom Fassbender had sent off this DASI computer to the Grand Chutes uh, Police Department. Officer Veely did a, his thing on it, sent back a CD uh, with, you know, basically d detailing what was on in the computer and, uh, and then like a, a report basically that he you know generated as he was you know looking at the computer and testing it and stuff so th there's that's what that's what's basically going on here um some a little bit of new stuff and essentially she's ready now she's throwing down the gauntlet she's just basically going okay look i've i'm i'm here presenting a, a huge amount of 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 reasonable doubt and not just one or two things, but there's a lot of things going on here, and she's not gotten her evidentiary hearing. So she is now saying, look, this is the last time. I'm filing this now, but this is the last time. If you don't, if you choose not to respond to this, then I'm going, we're going, we're going to file with the appeals court tomorrow, which is November 17th of 2017. So that's what she's doing. She's like, okay, you know. There's all this evidence that I that that keeps coming up. The content on the computer um, is is undeniable. You know that that computer content was certainly something that required more attention. I mean that's and the and and the fact that it's something that requires more attention, but it actually got obscured by being kind of buried by like I said one piece of paper in a huge batch of discovery that says there is a CD and and, an, and a report about what was on that computer the the defense didn't have that that report didn't have that CD and didn't realize what was on that computer when they were trying to argue suspects that can meet the Denny requirement they were not so they basically didn't have that now the guilters are going to say, oh, well, that piece of paper was in the discovery. They had the chance to see it, and they could have asked for it. Yeah, I guess so. But then how do you explain, why, why, is, the, why is the evidence in being held by Tom Fassbender personally? Those two items, just those two items, are personally held in Tom Fassbender's custody. Huh? Anyway, it's odd. That's really strange. And what makes it even more kind of screwy is the fact that Dean and Jerry are savvy lawyers. They, they you know, realized that with the huge batches of discovery and stuff, maybe there would have been some kind of piece of evidence that maybe they might have missed that there was something in the reports about. And they actually went down to the Calumet evidence locker to just go over all of the pieces of evidence and look at them and stuff. And and Jerry specifically says that he does not remember there being that CD and that report. And the reason why, the reason why he doesn't remember it being there is because it was in Tom Fassbender's personal custody. I mean, when did Tom Fassbender open up the evidence storage company? I mean, what the heck? I Wouldn't it make more sense if like it was... Tom Fassbender went and, and, and took it to DCI and, and, and it was being held over at like DCI's, you know, evidence locker or whatever. But maybe that would have created a paper trail. You know, it would create the, the paperwork created 
by logging it in over at DCI would have tipped probably Dean and Jerry off and they would have seen it. I'm, I mean, why is it in his personal custody? That's just odd to me. Sorry, that is very, very strange. So we're going to see some things here, folks. We got some, got some documents here for you to see. I, I'm obviously going to kind of give you the Cliff Notes version. Um, you know, things that I thought were the most important, essentially. But obviously, obviously, the I will obviously be leaving the documents with the attachments in a link down below the video. So here we go. We're going to move into the first set of documents. Oh, by the way, you may have noticed today that I am dressed up looking a little spiffy here. My buddy Paul Capaldi sent me this from Scotland, so it was it was very nice of him, and I just had to wear it and say thanks, Paul. Um, Paul also does some YouTube videos over on his channel. I don't know if any of you know that. You can go check him out. Uh, I'll leave a link to one of his videos also below so that you can go over there and check that out. Uh, so here we go. We're going to go ahead and move into the documents. This first one, folks, is a little bit. I had to. There's a lot of that I just couldn't leave out. So there's a there's a, a little bit of text coming up here, but I'll be reading it for you so you can even put your phone down and and just listen to me tell what tell you what's there cuz trust me, you know the documents are in my videos, you know, I'm not going to be BSing you. So anyways, <laughs> here we go. On November 11th, 2017, undersigned counsel Kathleen Zellner had a meeting with Mr. Avery's trial attorneys, Jerome B Jerome Buting and Dean Strang. One of the purposes of this meeting was to determine whether certain evidence was disclosed to Mr. Avery's trial attorneys before his trial. During the meeting, it was discovered that, in fact, the state failed to disclose material exculpatory evidence related to Bobby Dassey's status <clears throat> as a potential suspect. Specifically, the state failed to disclose the report of a forensic analysis performed on a computer to which Bobby Dassey had access prior to and after Teresa Halbach was murdered. Such evidence would have strengthened Mr. Avery's Denny motion, which was pending at the time, and the computer forensics report should have been disclosed. Disclosure of the computer forensics report would have enabled Mr. Buting to meet the Denny standard by establishing a motive of sexual assault for the murder of Ms. Halbach and to introduce Bobby Dassey as the alternate suspect to the jury. Mr. Buting's affidavit is attached in the second supplement. Mr. Beating states that when Ken Kratz tendered discovery to Mr. Avery's defense, Mr. Kratz itemized the discovery in cover letters which accompanied the disclosure of the documents. By way of correspondence dated December 14, uh, 2006, Mr. Kratz disclosed a large batch of discovery. Included in the discovery was a report from Special Agent Tom Fassbender entitled Examination of Brendan Dassey computer. The report number was DCI report number blah 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 blah. And the report was dated December 7th of 2006. As described in Special Agent Tom Fassbender's report, the state seized a computer from the Dassey residence on April 21st of 2006. The report indicates that the computer was then transferred to Detective Mike Veely at the Grand Chute Police Department for forensic examination. Per Special Agent Fassbender's report, Detective Veely returned the computer to F Special Agent Fassbender on May 11, 2006. The report further states that a subsequent date Special Agent Fassbender received from S Detective Veely a CD entitled Bren Dassey's Computer Final Report Investigative Copy. The report also states that the CD contained information on the website and images from the hard drive. And Mr. Buting Avers, in his affidavit, that neither of the above referenced CD or the Detective Veely's investigative report were turned over in discovery. The December 14, 2006 letter from Mr. Kratz likewise confirms by omission that neither document was disclosed to the defense in the batch of discovery. Mr. Buting likewise notes that Special Agent Fassbender's report indicates he did not book the CD or Detective Veely's report into evidence. Rather, the report states that the disc received from Doc Detective Veely as well as the hard copy pages uh, of instant message conversation were maintained in Special Agent Fassbender's possession. Thus, Mr. Buting did not observe the CD entitled Dassey's Computer Final Report Investigative Copy, 
when he reviewed the evidence maintained by the Calumet County Sheriff's Office prior to the Mr. Avery's trial. To the best of Mr. Buting's recollection, he never saw the CD entitled Brendan Dassey's Computer Final Report Investigative Copy because he thinks that would have stood out in his mind. It would have caught his attention. Although the state has never disclosed Detective Veeley's final report, the report must contain evidence favorable to Mr. Avery, as noted in Mr. Avery's motion for reconsideration. Gary Hunt, a, a forensic computer expert, has performed an analysis of the Dassey hard drive. Mr. Hunt has further refined his analysis of the, of the Dassey computer to isolate violent images of sexual acts that involve the infliction of physical pain and torture and on an equally disturbing fascination with viewing dead female bodies. Importantly, many of these searches were performed at times when only Bobby Dassey was home during the week from 6.30 to 3.45. All other Dassey family members who lived in the residence were either at school or at work during those hours. However, Scott Taddock was observed driving towards the Dassey residence in his green truck on several occasions during the time period. Mr. Avery never accessed the Dassey computer and did not have the password for the computer. Mr. Avery did not have a key to the Dassey residence and the residence was locked when no one was home. Mr. Avery all only entered the residence with permission of a Dassey family member. Mr. Avery worked during the weekdays from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. The supplemental affidavit of Stephen Avery is attached and incorporated herein. Mr. Buting describes the significance of the state's concealment of the Detective Veeley's final report in his affidavit. At the at the time the voluntariness discovery the, I'm sorry at the time the voluminous discovery was tendered on December 14th of 2006 defense counsel was preparing to litigate a Denny motion to introduce evidence of third party suspects at Mr. Avery's trial judge Willis ruled against the defense on this Denny motion because the defense failed to present any evidence of the motive for murder had the defense been able to to use Detective Veeley's report to link Bobby Dassey into violent sexual or deceased body images on the Dassey computer, the defense would have been able to establish sexual assault as the motive for Miss Hallbach's murder. So you see what I mean, folks, where they're, they're basically intentionally trying to hide that information from Officer Veeley. It's pretty obvious. I mean, why is that the only two pieces of evidence that are held particularly in Tom Fassbender's custody? I mean, what? That's just really odd. Okay, so, you know, pretty clear there was some shenanigans going on there. You know, no, <laughs> let's be real about it, right? So, so now we're going to move on now to... We're going to go through what Zellner had to say about Bobby and Scott. I'm going to show you some of the list of things, like what they were, the searches on the computer were and stuff. I'm going to show you her list of what, you know, what about Scott, you know, makes him fit as a suspect. Um, so we're going to go through some things right here that you'll see. Um, she's really kind of being a lot more specific in this particular filing. She's really kind of you know, offering a lot of detail, um, and, and really trying to, you know, put a timeline together almost in a, in a sense. So we'll just move into that document now and we'll come on back. Okay. These are some of the searches on the computer. Five additional searches for terms describing drowned, dead, or deceased female bodies, specifically deceased girls or diseased girls and rotten. 50 additional searches for terms describing the infliction of violence on females, including fisting and images of females in pain, specifically girls groaning bleep face, fist fuck, girl moaning bleep face, and girl guts. So that was just some of the searches that were happening. Um, see the second supplemental affidavit of Greg McCrary for his take on why this behavior or why these searches suggest a pattern of behavior. Mr. Avery would be eliminated from all but 15 of the 128 searches at the is as the simple issue as he was arrested on November 9th. Mr. Avery, in his unrebutted affidavit that he never accessed or used the Dave Dassey computer at any time, must much less to search for violent images of dead bodies. At the forensic analysis done of Mr. Avery's computer revealed no searches for sexual images and less violent and much less and much less violent images of and dead bodies. Brendan Dassey would be eliminated 
from all but 26 of the 128 searches at issue by having been arrested on March 1st of 2006. The state's concealment of the Vile report prejudiced the defense. The, de the report would have provided the defense with the ability to meet the Denny standard and therefore would have raised reasonable doubt resulting in Mr. Avery's acquittal. The existence of this new Brady violation undermines confidence in the verdict against Mr. Avery. At a bare minimum, Mr. Avery should be allowed to present the, uh, this evidence at a significant Brady violation at an evidentiary hearing. Scott Taddock as a, as a potential suspect. Greg McCrary, current post-conviction counsel's police investigation and procedure expert, opines that Mr. Taddock was not thoroughly investigated as a potential suspect by the law enforcement during Ms. Halbach's murder investigation, but he should have been for the following reasons. Several incidents of violence against women were reported about Mr. Taddock, one of which resulted in a battery conviction on July 29th of 1997. Mr. Taddock's multiple inconsistent statements severely undermine his credibility at trial. See motion for reconsideration. Mr. Taddock should have been investigated regarding his actions on November 3rd of 2005 in light of the anonymous handwritten note discovered by the Green Bay Post Office and reported to the Green Bay Police Department. Mr. Taddock worked at the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry at 838 South 16th Street, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. The note specifically refer referenced a body being burned at 3 a.m. at an aluminum smelter. Mr. Taddock worked the third shift of the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry. The note, which was never thoroughly investigated by law enforcement, enforcement is potentially the great evidentiary value because the note was sent on November 9th of 2005 and it was not disclosed to the public until November 11th of 2005 that Miss Halbach had allegedly been burned in the in the Avery burn pit um, <clears throat> current post-conviction counsel's investigator James Kirby has confirmed that Mr. Taddock's nickname at work was skinny and according to a current employee many of the shift workers are not totally literate it is a reasonable inference that a semi-literate employee might have misspelled the word skinny in the note. Mr. Taddock should have been investigated more thoroughly by law enforcement during the Halbach murder investigation. At a minimum, Mr. Taddock should have been asked to provide his DNA and fingerprints so that they could be compared to the crime scene evidence. Mr. Taddock's failure to respond to Kevin Ramlow's text about seeing the RAV4 at the turnabout by the old dam in November of 2005 before the discovery of the Halbach vehicle on the Avery property is also suspicious. Affidavit of Kevin Ramlow included. This re his recent telephone call with Mr. Avery demonstrates his knowledge that Miss Halbach had left the Avery property on October 31st of 2005. The telephone call also demonstrates that Mr. Taddock has a violent and uncontrollable temper. Mr. Taddock threatened to physically assault Mr. Avery and even more disturbingly put Mr. Avery in the ground. See the supplemental motion. So, like I said before, those images and the, the searches on the Dassey computer, the combined with the fact that there was actually ter pictures of Teresa Halbach there, all that together is a cause for concern. Like I said before, if it was just one or two of those things, then then you could probably go, you know, well, okay, it's probably maybe harmless, right? But when it's all three of those things, it's kind of like an on the head sort of situation, nail on the head situation. But, you know, there's obviously different ways to analyze evidence and different ways to assess it. So we'll leave that for the courts. Um, obviously, just like before, you know, everybody here that she's talking about, the Scott, Bobby, you know, the Ryan, anybody else, you know, all innocent until proven guilty. That's the way it is. Because if, if we're mad that Stephen kind of got a raw deal or was, was, you know, given the shaft, we can't, we gotta, we gotta make sure that everybody else that gets attached to this gets their day in court, that gets an honest chance, you know, to provide their defense that, you know, like Stephen Avery has been prevented here. So, which is becoming more and more obvious, you know, Tom Fassbender's personal custody, you gotta be kidding me. But anyway, there's also in there talking about Scott Taddock. So, I don't know if you guys got that, but they were talking about the the nickname Skinny, 
um, and on the letter that went to the Green Bay Post Office and got you know turned into the Green Bay Police Department. And if you guys will know that, that's the Sikaki letter. You know, pretty much everybody who's involved with MAM knows about the Sikaki letter. Now, what Zellner is basically saying here is that number one, Scott worked the third shift, which is like would be at three in the morning. And she's also saying that a current employee at the aluminum foundry uh, said that it's very common for their employees there to have, to be less than literate. Okay. So what she's basically saying here is that she thinks that maybe the sick a key letter wasn't supposed to say sick a key. It was just horrible grammar, horrible, horrible handwriting, and that it was actually supposed to say skinny you know, put her in the smelter or whatever, aluminum smelter. So that's what she's kind of going with. I don't know. It looks a little, not sure, not, not sure that that's true. Um, but it's been a long time since I looked at the sick key letter. So um, obviously I'll be looking at that stuff coming up here real soon because this obviously isn't going to be the only video about this, uh, about this particular motion because I think I'm going to do an additional one, possibly two. Uh, talking about the attachments, which are interesting. So, okay, we're going to go ahead now and move into the last segment, um, and then we'll come on back. Whether or not an attorney is experienced is not the criterion for determining whether counsel was effective in a particular case. And the fact that an attorney is ineffective in a particular case is not a judgment on the general competency of that, attor of that lawyer. It is merely a determination that a particular defendant was not appropriately protected in a particular case. As Judge Bazelon has written, ineffectiveness is neither a judgment of the motives or abilities of lawyers, nor an inquiry into culpability. The concern is simply whether the adversary system has functioned properly. The, the question is not whether the defendant received the assistance of effective counsel, but whether he received the effective assistance of counsel. In applying this standard, judges should recognize that all lawyers will be ineffective some of the time. The task is too difficult and the human animal too fallible to expect otherwise. Bazelon, The, Reali the Realities of Gideon and Arger Singer. Current post-conviction counsel has previously alleged that the trial defense counsel was ineffective for their failure to consult with a blood spatter expert who would have opined that Stephen Avery's blood was selectively planted in Miss Hallbach's vehicle and that the rear cargo door, door blood, blood, spl blood spatter was the result of Miss Hallbach being hit in the head with a mallet or hammer as she lay on the ground next to the driver's side rear wheel of the vehicle and not, as the state contended, from being tossed into the back of the vehicle. A blood spatter expert would also have prevented the defense from erroneously claiming that 1996 blood vial was the source of Stephen Avery's blood discovered in Miss Hallbach's vehicle. Current post-conviction counsel has previously alleged that the trial defense counsel was ineffective for their failure to prevent, present a ballistics expert who would have opined that if Miss Hallbach were shot through the skull by item FL, there would have been bone fragments embedded in, in, in item FL. Okay, so there she talks about ineffective assistance of counsel, and she offers what um, of, of another judge said about ineffective assistance of counsel, and and basically she's basically establishing that because counsel is ineffective in one case doesn't necessarily mean that that counselor or that lawyer him, themselves are ineffective. It's just that in that one case, they were ineffective to help the defendant that they were trying to defend. So they're basically saying there's no real culpability or anything along those lines. It's just sometimes uh, a lawyer falls short because of the complicated nature of the job or because of human failings. It just It's just something that's going to happen. So it has to be considered. So then it goes on to talk about now. This is one of the things that is a huge big deal for me. Okay, it's uh, and and I I did a video about it and it's uh, I may I go to I'll go ahead and post it below so you guys know what it's talking about. It's the the video about the blood spatter, and she brings up the blood spatter here, that because Dean and Jerry didn't bring in a a proper blood spatter expert who would have been able to you know testify and and kind of dissipate some of the illusions that were were going on here. 
uh, particularly where Teresa Halbach was murdered, which was not in the trailer or the garage, which we've all known forever. Well, any of us that, you know, have, you know, any sense, really. Because you don't, you can't murder somebody somewhere and just completely not have any trace of it. Especially when you use a gun and there's high velocity spatter and, you know, no. So, that's the, one of the most interesting things. She brings up that. So I'll post a link to my blood spatter video below so you can check out what that's all about. And then she brings up the the fact that the bullet had bone didn't have bone fragments in it. It had wooden paint fragments or whatever, but it did not have bone fragments in it. And that Dean and Jerry could have brought in experts to testify that, you know, the 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 bullet should have bone fragments in it. Well, I don't know exactly how Dean and Jerry might have been able to do that. Uh, I don't know if Micro Trace was up and running in 2007, but maybe it was. Uh, I don't know if it would have been advanced enough in 2007 to be able to detect the minute bone particles. Uh, but, I, you know, the point is is that they definitely did miss bringing in a buzz, blood spatter expert. I totally 100% agree with her on that. They really, really should have done that. Um, that would have helped the case greatly, really, in my opinion. Because just look at what her, her blood spatter expert figured out. I mean, I'm. It's my opinion. I am convinced that that he found the crime scene. That that it was right at the back of her Rav Four, wherever it was, which we now have heard now from more more than one person that she left that yard. She left. So that's where we're at. You know, Zellner's basically coming out guns blazing she's like okay look guys look i'm i'm sitting here trying to go through the process here i'm trying to let you know there's a lot of evidence to go through here the state's attorneys have already agreed to more testing that you know the thing that that's funny about that is that fallon in, in, the, in the state decided to you know make a deal with her and so that she could test more things right because in my opinion, I mean, why would they do that, right? Why would they do that? Unless they thought the evidentiary hearing was going to be granted. And unless they, I mean, to my mind, that means Fallon thought that she was going to get her hearing. Whether or not it went beyond that, he, I, think, I think it shows that he thought she was at least going to get that. And the fact that she has now not gotten that, and there's there now is this agreement between her and Fallon in the state essentially that is is being prevented from being honored by the decision made by the judge. So it's it's really interesting here what's going on. But I I judge by the fact that Fallon was making agreements with Zellner that he was already assuming that there was going to be an evidentiary hearing that he I think by his own assessment he figured that that by the way that they rule or by the way that they determine whether uh, evidence meets the standard to grant an evidentiary hearing he obviously must have looked at that motion and thought there was more than one or two things that would have to be you know argued in court it's my opinion I may be wrong but I'm probably right because why did he agree to do all that stuff only to have the judge deny it and I mean, look at what Zellner's saying that, like I said in one of my videos, that the, the the standard that you have to meet to get an evidentiary hearing isn't isn't super high. It's just you just got to be able to show a, a few certain factors, a few certain things, the the kind of the when, where, what, and why's of why that what you're introducing is important. And if it's if it stands to reason, basically, then it, it then an evidentiary hearing is supposed to be held. So, that's where we're at right now. She's given the state one last chance with this today. If she doesn't hear anything by tomorrow, I guess, she's pretty much ready to take it over to the appeals court and have the appeals court decide on whether or not the, to vacate Judge Sukowitz's decision um, to, to basically deny Avery and to essentially overrule Judge Willis's uh, previous order that 
that the that a, that the Avery's the attorneys and Avery himself would be able to test the evidence. Um, that was something he put in there that I guess he thought was important, which is one good thing that Judge Willis did. So I gotta give it to him. So we gotta we gotta see where this is going, but it looks like we're going to appeals court with this. So you know could get interesting. That's about it for this video, folks. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe, and we'll see ya. And thank you, Paul.